What's up, YouTube? It's your boy JP. He's on the keys in this two He's on the video today, and we have Napoleon's Marshals Part One, the newest epic history TV video. Without further ado, let's just get to it, bruh. Terror Belly, Decus Bacchus. Terror in War, Ornament in Peace. The words inscribed on every French Marshal's baton. In France, the title of Marshal or Maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. That year, he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. Eight more were created in the years that followed. The marshals outranked everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes and ministers of state. They came from every background, sons of aristocrats and innkeepers, professional soldiers and those who'd learned on the job, old school Republicans and Bonaparte loyalists. The youngest, just half the age of the oldest. And though Marshal was a civil title, not strictly a military rank, the men known to the army as les gros bonnets, the big hats, were arguably the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant, and flawed group of military commanders in history. Yo, I like, I like watching this doc. This is like a movie, you know what I mean? I like how he makes it so much like a movie, just like the editing. Like the editing is amazing. I need to I need to know how you how they, he edits like that. You know what I mean? Because that editing is so amazing. Like this really seems like a whole movie right now. The most favored were showered with titles and wealth, but the price too was high. Half were wounded, three were killed or died of wounds, two were executed. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. First, a thank you to our sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game played by millions of users worldwide that gives you the chance to rewrite World War II history. Choose your country by conquering territory and cap. More than 2,000 French generals served in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. Bertrand, Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who would come out... So these, so these are like honorable mentions, like, okay, these are the people that probably could have been marshals, but were not picked, okay, I see. Just like the outside, like, like you barely missed it. Like, okay. ...did 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. Clozel a veteran commander of the war in Spain. Dessay, Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. Gérard, one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814, made a marshal by King Louis-Philippe in 1830. Goudin, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Junot, who first served with Napoleon at Toulon in 1793, probably committed suicide after his fall from favor in 1813. La Salle, the Hussar general, among the best light cavalry commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, killed at Wagram, aged 34. Maison, 
who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, made marshal by King Charles X in 1829. Non Souti, the heavy cavalry commander who died of wounds and exhaustion, aged 46. Saint-Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz, died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. Van Damme, of whom Napoleon once said, if I had to invade hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. And now, Napoleon's 26 marshals, ranked in order of merit. All right, let's go. See, this, I, I can tell this is not going to be a video where I'm talking a whole lot. I'm sitting here, I'm watching. I may answer a comment every now and then. Because I know some of y'all, it's like, you pause at the worst moment. You pause right when he's about to say something he ruins the flow of the video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit back and I'm going to just sit here and just, I'm going to just let, I'm going to just let him talk. 26. Marshal Perignon. When Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, four were honorary marshals recognized for past service to France. Perignon was one of these. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief retirement, he was sent to Italy and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi, where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians and Perignon was badly wounded and captured. His appointment as Honorary Marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon, a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by emphasizing continuity with the revolution, by rewarding its military heroes. Perignon never held active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma and later Naples. Okay, so that was so he basically did that as kind of like a like a chess move to kind of hey this guy Napoleon is really he's really for the rebellion no not for the, he's really like he supported the revolution like maybe we can get behind this dude because he appreciates the people that made the sacrifice for our country a few years back you see I like the calculated maneuvers though his eldest son Pierre was a cavalry officer killed at Friedland in 1807. Perignon retired in 1813, but refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815 and was stripped of his marshal's baton. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. 25. Marshal Brune. Brune was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. As a fiery rep his support was political former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges Danton. His support was politically useful for Napoleon. Brune joined the army during the Terror, the most extreme period of the revolution. His political connections ensured rapid promotion, and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris with the famous whiff of grape shot. Brune then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early victories. He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander and enthusiastic plunderer of Italian towns and churches. In 1798, he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland, while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes, the equivalent of several million dollars today. It was said that Brune's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. The next year, he won his most important victory while commanding French forces in Holland, defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castricum, and saving France from invasion. Okay, so what I'm assuming is these first few gen these first few marshals are going to be because he needs like people behind it. These are political moves because he's still fairly new as 
the leader of France. So I guess Napoleon wants to like establish like some type of coup with the old revolutionary with the soldiers like hey like we can still like we still want you to fight we still want you to represent our country okay like i see he definitely was a forward thinker because he definitely knows that he needs these type of men in his army because they already have military experience and they've won major battles see but a short, calamitous spell commanding the army of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brun was not fit for high command. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, where in 1804, he learned that he'd been made a marshal. But Brun's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self-importance, did not make him a successful diplomat. He was recalled to France, but as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again, drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French emperor. Whether a deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious, and Brun was sacked. Brun spent the next seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814, and rallied to Napoleon when he returned from exile the next year. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brune was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered and tossed into the River Rhone. 24. Marshal Serrurier. He retained all the characteristics and severity of an infantry major, an honest man, with integrity and reliability, but unfortunate as a general. You know, this man, Napoleon, is really, like, I like he really knows the stuff. Like, he's like, you know what, I see what, I see what you're doing, but you ain't ready. You're not, you're not ready for the big, you're not ready to be up here with the big boys. I'm going to send you somewhere else. Like, you, you Marshal, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you're ready for all that. You might want to sit down a little bit, get your skills up. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognize for past service. In contrast to Brun, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school, a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and a stern disciplinarian. This background was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Commissioned into... Leon Militia, age 13. Okay, I'm just assuming he got his... I'm just assuming that the math is wrong. But, whatever. Okay, so he would be 14. Active service in Germany and Portugal. At 14 years old. This man is literally fighting in... <laughs> this man is... In the... In the... Like the National Army at 14. It's not like he's a... Not like he's just... He's a little drummer boy coming up. Like it says militia, so that means he he had a gun. He was fighting at fourteen, bro. At fourteen, I'm a, I'm trying to figure out what high school I'm going. What a freshman in high. I'm a freshman in high school at fourteen. I'm not in armies in with with full with like, bruh. You know how crazy that is. Like you're you're okay. You're a full-blown soldier at 14, and then by the time you're 21, you got, you already a veteran. You a veteran at 21, you got seven years experience. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognized as assets to the new French Republic. By 1795, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy, where his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname, the Virgin of Italy. Serrurier was a reliable, if unspectacular, commander who won an important victory at Mondovi at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'etat 
of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command, but Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal and governor of Les Invalides, the retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good gesture. That's, 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 nice. that's very nice of him, you know what I'm saying? That, that's, a, that's a very honor, that's an honorable move. There, shortly before the fall of Paris in 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards to prevent them falling into Allied hands. 23. Marshal Kellerman. Kellerman was another honorary marshal, the oldest at 68, and famed throughout France as the savior of the revolution. A career soldier from a middle-class background, he'd seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. At the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Régime. But at Valmy, in September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Centre stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history that saved the infant French Republic. When the revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links and spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. Acquitted and restored to command, he was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer then in favour of a rising new talent, General Bonaparte. Kellerman later specialised in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as President of the Senate. His son, General Francois Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. Like that. First of all, the family ties, and then the the real the, the the crazy part was that Bonaparte was the one that was over him in the in the for the general. That that's you know what I'm saying like how everything comes back around, and then he makes then he makes you a marshal. You know what I'm saying? What goes around like everything just comes back full circle. Marshal Grouchy. His conduct was as unforeseeable as if his army on the march had been struck with an earthquake and swallowed by an earthquake and squ swallowed up. Uh -oh. When Napoleon returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment, Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution, Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars, fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a dragoon division in Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He was praised by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Ailo. Played an important role buying time for... Oh, there we go with these. I, I love these. I like these animations. They're just... They're interesting to watch. Napoleon at Friedland. And expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps and was wounded at Borodino. He survived the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. He returned for Napoleon's 1814 campaign in France, and was wounded twice more. Grouchy was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign, 
and commanded Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Prussians to prevent them joining up with Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Two days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders rather than march to join Napoleon, and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. Grouchy's vilific... I mean, can you, can you really... Can you say anything else, though? Because obviously, at this point, at that point, Napoleon's army was a, was full of a bunch of really young conscripts and some old generals that, like, the, the only ones that were left that actually survived all the other previous wars before then. So if you got a, if you got an army full of inexperienced, like, 18 to 24-year-old, let's just say, an, as an age group, very inexperienced men who have not had a whole lot of military experience. And you got the old generals who are, just, who are again, who are old and do not have as much energy as they used to have. He's obviously relying on all the help he can get. He's relying on, Napoleon was definitely relying on like flanking techniques and trying to sneak. It wasn't like, it wasn't back in the day when he can just blitzkrieg and just come and just Oh, I can I can send every I can send everybody at you because I have the advantage. No, he had to he had to be tactical now. He couldn't just go full force into it. Vacation is not wholly fair, not least because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to show initiative, and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Nor should one blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grande Armée's best cavalry generals. Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape royalist reprisals, but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. 21. Marshal Monsey. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. But then came the French Revolution. Most French officers were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. The result was that three quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reaped the benefit with meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monsey was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish, on what was admittedly a relative backwater of the Revolutionary Wars. In 1797, he was dismissed for alleged royalist sympathies, but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. By his own admission, Monsey was a sensitive officer. Honest, honourable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. Napoleon was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804 as part of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed Inspector General of the Gendarmerie, France's militarised police force and spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, operating in the south of the country with mixed success. In 1809, he was replaced by General Junot and returned to France. Okay, so... So when I'm when I'm getting this this guy Monty was he was so he was what Napoleon would call middle of the pack average like he didn't do he didn't do anything extraordinary but he wasn't terrible like he was just average like he got the he came to the battle every day he got the job done he probably wasn't gonna win you a battle but he was that jeez I'm out here knocking stuff over. He definitely wasn't going to win you a battle, but he was definitely going to provide an instrumental part. He was going to do his part. You know, he was going to help the he was going to help the French 
win any cause. Monse's finest hour came in the dying days of the Empire, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defence of the French capital. In 1815, the restored King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monse to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Monse regarded Ney as a hero for having saved so many French lives in Russia, and refused, declaring, If I am not allowed to save my country, nor my own life, then at least I will save my honour. After a short spell in prison, Monse was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St Helena in 1840. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monse announced, And now, let us go home to die. 20. Marshal Poniatowski Prince Józef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army, even serving as aide-de-camp to Emperor Joseph II himself. In 1789, he transferred to the Polish army with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by its rapacious neighbours, Russia, Prussia and Austria. By 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Prussia in 1806, Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Sombre, serious and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish V Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically throughout the campaign, motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. But by the end of the retreat, Fifth Corps had been virtually destroyed. Poniatowski remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813 and was given command of the Polish Eighth Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon, in recognition of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. Poniatowski was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honour. He and his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rearguard, but their only escape route, a bridge over the Elster River, was blown up too soon. Badly wounded, Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river, but he was swept from his saddle and drowned. He had been a marshal for just four days. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. But Poniatowski's legend lived on, a model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. Well, at least he tried, you know what I mean? At least he tries to show a little bit of nationalism. He's like, you know what? Maybe I can get my country back. So I'm going to trust him in the hope that maybe I can get my country back and I can help my people back. But unfortunately, they didn't win, so he didn't get his country back until 100 years later. Marshal Jodin.
As a young French private, Jourdan saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War. But he then caught a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. When the French Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit, fought at the battles of Jemap and Honschauta, and was rapidly promoted to general. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable for the French Army's use of balloon reconnaissance, the first effective use of an aircraft in military history. Yeah, that's hard. That's tough. They really are here using hot air balloons for reconnaissance purposes. That's tough. Like, just imagine you're an enemy and you see a, a big hot air balloon. Imagine somebody sniping you from that hot air balloon. How would you feel? Jourdan became a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalized France's policy of mass conscription. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, but his fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. When Joseph became King of Spain in 1808, Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. But the situation in Spain would prove beyond Jourdan's military skills to solve. He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals by Wellington, leading to the collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jourdan never held a major command again, but his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognized and respected. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Join us for part two, when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. Thank you to Call of Right, you know, I like them type of, I like those type of videos like you can just sit back and watch. You don't have, I don't have to do too much commentary. I can just sit back and watch. And are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? But anyway, thank you again for watching. Leave a like if you enjoy. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel. Don't forget to share your video wherever you share videos at. But anyways, thank you again. Please. Be safe. Please have a great day. I'm out. Peace.